just climb down, baby. Per, per, per capita export value. Library. Chris, are you embarrassed by your behavior today? There's, there's a lot of bleeding hearts around. Do you have the fortitude or the gold ass to stand up and come across here and say that to me, you son of a bitch? Just watch me. He certainly went too far, Mr. Speaker, when he st I saw him stick his tongue out. Contemptuous disregard. More than a slab of bacon talking here. The disappointment you also feel is my responsibility. I lost my temper. What is the nature of your thoughts? The word was F-A-R-T. Hi, this is Reese, and I have a very special bonus episode I wanted to share with you. So about a year ago, I was approached by somebody called Dean Barnes. He is an educator and advocate for diversity and inclusion um, and equality in, in sport and specifically hockey. Dean had collected over 100 rookie cards of black and biracial players who'd made it to the NHL and was looking to have a podcast where he could tell the stories of each individual player. And we managed to find an amazing partner in eBay Canada who kindly agreed to fund the project and, and help us kind of get everything off the ground. And I wanted to share the Bill Riley episode with you. Bill was incredible. He grew up in rural Nova Scotia in the 1950s. A lot of poverty, a lot of racism. And through sheer force of will and hard work and ambition and the support of his family and the amazing African Nova Scotian hockey heritage that, that he grew, kind of grew up around, he was able to make it to the NHL. So I thought it'd be really cool to share this episode with you. It's, it's designed to be family friendly. We purposefully designed the show so that families could listen to these stories in the car on the way to the rink. So if you love hockey and you've got kids and you'd like them to hear these trailblazing stories with these players, then I suggest you take a listen to Bill's story and then go to My Hockey Hero, wherever you get your podcasts, and you can listen to all of the other stories. There are 10 episodes we've done in total so far, and I really hope that you enjoy them. Hello, my name is Dean. I live in Burlington, Ontario, and I love hockey. Ever since I was a kid... I collected hockey cards with spare change my dad gave me. As a black person, to see others like me on the ice inspired me. They were my role models and showed me hockey is a game for everyone. I've collected 100 rookie cards for NHL's black and biracial players, and I'm going to talk to all of them so you can learn their stories. Please welcome Caps alumnus, Bill Riley. Bill Riley made his NHL debut with the Capitals in 1974, becoming the first black Nova Scotian to play in the NHL and the third black player to play in the league. Bill Riley was born in 1950 in Amherst, Nova Scotia. He played for the Washington Capitals and Winnipeg Jets between 1974 and 1980. I come from a small town in Amherst and nobody would have, uh, you know, given me a, sn a snowball's chance in hell of, of making it all the way to the National Hockey League. Bill's story is one of an unlikely rise from poverty in rural Nova Scotia to NHL stardom. I'll tell you, I didn't even know I was the first African Nova Scotian to play in the National Hockey League. I didn't know that. Uh, Jerry Meehan, who was my teammate and then be went on to be the general manager of the Buffalo Sabres, he said, Billy, Riley was the first player of color to play meaningful minutes in the National Hockey League. I wasn't even aware of that. So, you know, now at uh, 65, 70 years old, I'm finding things out about myself and some of the accomplishments that, uh, that I had made that I, I didn't even realize I did. Growing up, he remembers hardworking parents fighting to make sure the family always had what they needed. Well... They, you know, there was uh, there were five five children, my my mother and father, and you know my mother was a domestic, and uh, you know she worked uh, she got very very little money, worked hard to she cleaned the uh, doctors and the lawyers and the rich folks' homes, and uh, you know usually come home with her day's pay in in a grocery bag because uh, I mean I believe when she started off she was getting two dollars a day and then she was up to five and I remember her getting to seven or eight dollars a day. And, uh, you know, I just thought, what a strong woman and what an incredible woman. And how did she ever feed, how did she ever feed five kids with that little bit of money? My dad, uh, my dad was in the, uh, military 
for a number of years. N- never stayed in long enough to get a pension or anything. And and all he knew, he didn't have a lot of uh, education, so all he did was hard, hard labor work and uh, and got very little pay as well. So you know, times were hard, and uh, you know, we played. Uh, we you know, we did the best we could. Uh, I I talked to some of my friends I grew up with today. And we talk about everybody thought they were the poorest family, and uh, we didn't we didn't realize what some of the other families were going through as well. But you know the thing was in our family we always had enough to eat, and uh, you know we always had clothes to wear. So you know I, I kudos to my parents for being able to make that happen. When Bill discovered hockey, he had to be resourceful as he lacked so much of the equipment. Well, my friend came to me one day and he was saying, oh, let's go play minor hockey because we played road hockey. We played road hockey every day. And when the pond scrolls over, then we'd be out and we'd play on the ponds outdoors. And, and uh, you know, you'd play there until your mother calls you in for supper type of thing. And uh, we had a bit of a rink in our backyard that my father made. And uh, like I said, we, we just we just played steady, played steady, played steady. And then my friend came to me one day and said, look, let's go sign up for minor hockey. And uh, I said, well, I, I don't have any money. I, I, how am I going to, how are we going to, it just not, doesn't cost anything. He said, it doesn't cost anything. And uh, so we went over and we put our names forth in this type of thing. And we were so excited about being able to play on natural ice for the first time. And I'm going to tell you a story that's true as God is in heaven. When we went for our first tryout, my cousin and I were both wearing catalogs for shin pads, and we had it tied up with, uh, they called it binder twine back in the day. That's what you, uh, that's what you, uh, they did the bales of hay and the bales of straw with. They used this type of rope, and that's what we used to try to tie these catalogs on. And, uh, yeah, yeah, and, uh, well, lo and behold, that day, that we were, we were a day early, and then of course somebody seen seen us wearing catalogs, and they got us a couple of old shin pads with the uh, with the sticks in them. There would be a cap on the knee, and then there'd be sticks for padding down the uh, the inside of them, and uh, and that's what we wore. We didn't have we did we didn't have gear. I mean, I can remember my best friend growing up. Him and I on the same team here in one pair of skates, you know, like he, 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 I'd be, I'd be on the first line. He'd, he'd be on the third line and then I, we'd switch. And, uh, like I said, and we were sharing, ho- sharing hockey sticks and sharing baseball gloves. We never had a whole lot. Bill was lucky enough to be surrounded by lots of very talented African Nova Scotian hockey players. His community had a long history in the sport, but often got overlooked. The older generation in front of me, there were a lot of very, very good black hockey players. Uh, you know, when I reflect back now and I realized how talented some of these guys were, but yet they never got any opportunities to play for the senior team or to go anyplace else. But I didn't realize that until after I got out and I got playing professional hockey and, you know, knowing how to assess talent and reflecting back on how good these guys were if somebody had to give them a chance. As his talents grew, by chance, Bill met someone who would give him the opportunity to move out west. Well, I went on to play junior hockey, and I, I led my team. We had a look, we were junior B, and we played in what's called the Maritime Junior A League now. And I, uh, I, you know, I led I led my team in scoring every year, and uh, it'd be like a major junior team. They had uh, the Halifax Junior Canadians, and they had the Charlottetown Islanders, and. They had the Cape Breton Metro's teams in Cape Breton and those, those types of things. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Gary Lewis came home for his father's funeral, and he was uh, working up in northern BC for the Lone Smeller, the Elk Elkan. And uh, he said the, lo- the local senior team's looking for hockey players. If you come out, you get a job. And I believe back then it was, you know, I'd get seven or eight dollars an hour, which home we were getting two. So I, I, you know, I didn't even hesitate because of the hockey. So I went out there and uh, I won the scoring race out there three years in a row and set, uh, set set all kinds of league records and that type of thing. And and that's where I got scouted. And I had the opportunity 
to go to uh, Philadelphia or Washington. I chose Washington because they were an expansion team, but I'm sort of getting a little bit ahead of myself. So what happened was they used to have uh, the pros would come into the hockey school in Kitimat. And they they come in and they teach hockey school every summer, and then they'd scrimmage at night, and uh, then we would have what a pro am game. So our senior club guys would play against those guys, and uh, I'm going, Jesus, I think I'm as good as these guys. And uh, so I asked a couple of guys, we're having a few pops after the game, and I said, Do you think I could play pro hockey? And they said. Uh, I think you could. I think you could pro, play pro hockey quite easily. They say, "Can you fight?" I said, "Yeah, I can fight. I'm very, I'm a very good fighter." I said, "I grew up in a real tough neighborhood, and you had to be one or two things: a good fighter or a good runner." And I said, "I'm both." <laughs> you know. Bill moved to Dayton, Ohio. However, when playing away, he'd often be the victim of racist abuse that sometimes got close to real danger. The fans were the fans were brutal. I mean, they, you know, uh, like Dayton. One thing I want to make very clear, though, is is that the, the people in Dayton treated me like a king. They treated me very good, and I never heard of any racial slur in Dayton, Ohio. When I went into Toledo, different story. When I went into Columbus, different story. I went into uh, we in Toledo, and they used to call it the Ohio State Turnpike Series. And they start their five toughest guys. We we start our five toughest guys, one second off the clock, and it'd be a five on five line line bro. And I tell people that that movie Slap Shot is not exaggerated a whole lot. So I get into a fight, and uh, I, uh, I I give the guy a pretty good beating. And I'm over in the penalty box. On that's on the other side, away from our rink, away from our our bench. And they're giving it to me. They're giving it to me. They're like, oh my God, they're just giving it to me. So, anyways, I serve my five minutes. I get out of the box. Guy comes out to me. He says, "You think you're tough?" He says, "Let's go." So, bang, we go again, and I beat him. So I get back to the bench after serving the second five, and uh, I'm sitting there, and I'm going. This is this is not for me. This is not for me. And in those days, uh, the the people, it, you're setting the, the four lines would just rotate over three three benches. And uh, the bench, the high bench, the people behind you could touch you. And uh, so, anyways, I go back out for my. Uh, I go. I'm going. I I don't really care if you push me back out there again, right? Because I was thinking about a quick bus back to Nova Scotia with all this violence and stuff. I never seen that before. I mean, I've seen a little bit in Canada, but nothing like this. So we, I get out there and at the face-off circle, and I just hear the, the crowd just buzzing, just buzzing, just buzzing. And, uh, you know, you can hear the roar. I said, what the hell's going on? So anyways, they're tough, they're tough guy. They're, they're big, their big guy comes over the boards. We square off, and I win that fight as well. So now I'm kicked out of the game. So when I'm being kicked out of the game, I have to go down through the fans and down through the uh, alleyway to, to the dressing room, and they're throwing beer on me and popcorn and spitting and screaming and hollering. I mean, like just like a lynch mob, right? And so then I get into the, I go into the uh, dressing room. I take the bench, put it up against the door, and I gotta hold it there, you know, because I want to make sure that they're not going to come in and get me because my teammates are still on the ice. I mean, you know, I was, I feared that. I feared that they'd come in. I was never, I never feared fighting a man one-on-one. -on -one. At the end of uh, the game, you know, we got on the bus, we went back to Dayton. And I'm thinking all the night, I said, geez, this is, you know, is this what's going to happen? This, this is really not for me, right? Uh, and type of thing. And, uh, and Tommy at that time knew I was tough, but didn't know that I could score like I could score. And uh, anyways, I was half thinking about, uh, I was half thinking about uh, going home and uh, he comes on the ice for practice and he goes, Riles, he says, every team in the league's trying to trade for you. He said, they heard what went on in De Dayton last night, right? And, they, and uh, I didn't realize that I fought three of the toughest guys in the league. 
and done quite well against them. Thank God I had Stan Jonathan on my team. I had Gordy Lane on my team. We had a tough hockey club, you know, Larry Belonchuk, Billy Billy Best from Nova Scotia. We had a tough hockey club, so we anything they threw at us, we could certainly handle. If you're enjoying My Hockey Hero and thinking about starting your own hockey card collection, I'd suggest you start with eBay. eBay is all about connecting communities and fueling passions. Because of its thriving card collector community, I was able to make my dream come true by collecting the rookie cards of the NHL's black and biracial players. Start your own collection at ebay.ca slash hockey cards. Now officially an NHL player it was time to take the ice for the first time for the Washington Capitals. At, I, I, at the time, I was just a guy who wanted to play hockey and couldn't believe that, you know, I was, I was, I was living a dream. I mean, uh, I, I grew up every Saturday night watching Hockey Night in Canada and studying the goaltenders, studying the players and, and that type of thing. So when I actually skated on the ice, uh, with Mike Marsden back in 1974 against the Philadelphia Flyers, I mean, I was a uh, I was a deer in headlights. And the first NHL game I ever seen in my life, I was playing in it. And the cap on the loft, they started me on the starting lineup, so I was standing out on the blue line for the uh, for the national anthem, and I was shaking so bad, I was trying to hold my legs. I said, I hope nobody's looking at me. I was shaking so bad. So the first NHL game I ever seen, I was playing in, and it was a good experience for me because I I was not ready to play at the National Hockey League level then. I was not not nowhere near ready, and I got sent back to Dayton. And uh, anyways, I went home in the summertime, and I said, you know what? I can play in that internationally. I can play in that league, and I can play good in that league. I was talking to the uh, coach and general manager Larry Mickey. God bless his soul. And I said to Mick, I said, Mick, I got offered a good job when I was home. And if I don't get a chance to go up, I said, I'm leading the team in three or four categories. And uh, guys are going up around me. And I know I'm a better player. I know I'm a tougher player, right? So if I'm not going to get an opportunity, I'm going to take the job. Well, by the Jesus, it wasn't two days later. I was on my way to Washington, right? And uh, for uh, what the, a 10-game trial. I played so well in the 10 games. I scored a few goals and, and I'd had a couple of fights. So they ended up having to keep me. Bill had to work hard to prove himself at every stage, but his happy memories of reaching the NHL are also mixed with memories of mistreatment. I had to keep my mouth shut for a lot of years, a lot of years. I heard a lot of things and turned a deaf ear to a lot of things being a man of color. And uh, uh, my teammates were great. I got to say my teammates in Dayton were great. My teammates in Washington were great. My coach comes in and tells me after my 10 games that uh, we're going to sign you. You know, you get, you'll be in the office tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. Well, I said, the, the bus is, uh, or the, yeah, the bus for the airport's leaving that, you know, and I'm going to say at 9 o'clock because we're playing in Buffalo that night. So he said, oh, no, you're going to fly in later on, right? they got to put this contract together for you, right? I'm I could hardly sleep that night. I, I just I was so excited. I'm going to sign, you know, like an NHL contract. He offered me $35,000 with no signing bonus. And my heart just sunk, right? It just sunk. I, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I couldn't believe the insult that this man was throwing at me. And uh, because back in the day, they had the Broad Street Bullies and the Big Bad Bruins and every team back in that era had you know a couple of guys on the bench that got tapped on the shoulder once or twice a, a, a game to go fight and these guys were making six figures you know i said i got three children and i'd like to have a decent car and this type of thing and i said what about a signing bonus oh there's no signing bonus he said no signing bonus finally he gave fifteen hundred dollars as a signing bonus only if he didn't sign the contract he said i got two airline tickets on the on the debt my dad's there one back to Dayton and one to Buffalo where you'll join the teammates. You sign the contract, you go to Buffalo. You don't sign the contract, you go back to Dayton. Well, I was making eleven thousand dollars in Dayton, so I, I had to. I was they held me ransom or hostage 
whatever you want to call it. I sold it. I signed the contract for $35,000. I went to Buffalo, my first game. I went to Buffalo. I had three points that night. Eventually, Bill found out that the Capitals were moving him down. Mike Myers and I, the, the training camp was in Hershey, Pennsylvania. We were probably just about through the whole training camp. And Mike Myers and I are coming back from lunch. And we walk into Hershey Arena, and the reporters are running at us like we're Wayne Gretzky, uh, uh, you know, and Bobby Orr. And then we're going, what the hell's going on? What the hell's going on? That's how we found out they, that we got sent down. Mike got sent to Bennington, and I got sent I got sent to Hershey. And that's how we found out. We didn't even have the courtesy of calling us in the office like they do with everybody else and assign you wherever. And uh, that's been something that's bothered me over the years. But again, I didn't want to ruin it for other kids of color coming up, so I said nothing about it. But after the shock of being moved down, two new friends helped him move on and develop. There was no way I deserved to be sent down. I was, you know, one of the, you know, I, I was playing on the top two lines, you know. And uh, so I just could never, ever understand it. But again, I, could, I couldn't rock the boat. And, uh, you know, and then I got, and, uh, then I got picked up uh, by Winnipeg in the, uh, the expansion draft, right? Bill never forgot where he came from and used his position to help those less fortunate. When I used to come home from hockey, I would have, I had an old truck and all the guys would take home their new sticks and they'd leave all the tape sticks behind. So I would throw all the tape sticks in the back of my hockey stick or in the back of my truck and any of the old hockey gloves and stuff. And I'd throw all that stuff in the back of my, my uh, vehicle. And my mother would I call my I talk to my mother every week, and she'd tell me the kids are all waiting for you to come home. The kids are all waiting for you to come home, and they 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 come every day to find out when I'm coming. So, anyways, when I pulled into my my mom's place, there'd be like 25 kids there waiting for me because they knew I had all these sticks and gloves and things that I was going to give them. Right. So, what has Bill learned that he thinks we can use in our own lives? Well. Uh, the thing is, the first thing I would tell them is you, you go to school and you get as much education as you can and you, uh, you know, you live a good life. You respect your parents because you only have one mother and you only have one father and, uh, you know, you, and your work ethic, it doesn't matter how much skill you have, how much talent you have. If you're lazy and you don't work, you're not going to, you're not going to be successful. So, Develop a strong work ethic in whatever endeavor you're at, and you will go far in life. We're proud to be working with Hockey Equality. Hockey Equality is on a mission to create diversity at all levels of the game of hockey by lowering financial barriers for BIPOC female and other equity deserving youth hockey players. If you've been moved by the story shared on this podcast and want to help make hockey accessible to all, Check out HockeyEquality.org. If you've enjoyed this podcast but would like to dive deeper, then check out our extended version of this interview at Recognize, Black Hockey Heroes of the NHL. You can click on the link in the show notes or find it wherever you get your podcasts. You can see the cards of the players in my collection at blackhockeycards.com. This has been a Podstarter production. production.